Good afternoon. It's almost evening, isn't it? Um, as JJ said, uh, we come from Blandford. Toby's around if I have a problem. Um, we're general practice and we do anything that makes some money. Um, but basically, you may be wondering why somebody of my age is coming along here questioning the way people are educated to be surveyors. Uh, I note that probably three out of the four speakers today are probably of my similar age, so we will have the audacity to kind of tell you what we think. Um, I'll tell you a couple of things first, nothing to do with surveying, but I think it has a, a, a pertinence. I was involved at some stage in training people to be lay preachers in the church. And that is under the Church of England. And they educate people so they can sit in and stand in pulpits and preach. And at one stage I was doing some mentoring. Now there they decided that people up on the pulpit should have degrees. And surprise, surprise, they suddenly lost volunteers to stand up in the pulpit. In the last few years, they've suddenly got it into their head that they've made a mistake. That you, St. Peter, if he came down, was going, not going to question the person in the pulpit as to whether he had a degree. The best preacher I ever knew was a farmer who came out from his cows in the morning and came and spoke to us. He was run of the mill. He knew what he was doing. I believe that somewhere along the line, the RICS made a complete cock-up in its education of surveyors. I would go back to the time that I started. Now, I'm not an old codger which says basically everything that was at my time of life was correct and what is not correct now is that we're not emanating what was there before. But at the time I started training to be a general surveyor, the scope of education was far, far larger. So when at the end of the day you were going to be qualified, you had a much better range of expertise to produce to the public, to serve them. And we now get to a situation where you have a surveyor sitting in an office and he has total blinkers on what he can actually advise. If you look at this, which came out of the RICS, it's talking about surveyors and what they can advise on. Our ICS members and registered firms operating in this area are reminded their professional obligations under Rule 4 of the RICS Rules of Contact for firms and RICS Rules of Contacts for members to possess the necessary competency in this specialist field. It goes on. Competency is thus rightly in the forefront of our minds. What has happened here is a prime example of surveyors acting beyond their skill and taking on a type of report they do not feel competent to complete. After the Grenfell Tower fire, we must constantly reflect on our skills and ask ourselves whether we are competent to take on a particular task. Last and most important is the issue of ethics, which is the bedrock of our professionalism. We must always act with proper regard to the technical standards we expected of us and only provide services of which we are competent and qualified. We must also act with integrity and accountability for our actions, paying the due heed to our principles will promote the trust in our profession, something that is called into question in this case. Having strict ethical standards is one of the characteristics that define us as professionals, and we cannot let this slip. My question is, have we not reduced ourselves to a point where we're educating surveyors which have, so they have very limited expertise. So when the public come to them, they can't advise. And that, I think, is a very serious issue. So if we go to the first one, what was the previous standard for what might have been better? If I go back to when I, I started being trained, which was in Bournemouth, <coughs> 
we had drawing boards. We could actually draw houses. We were educated in it. We were told about the legal profession. We had lectures on mathematics. And it was incredibly um, intensive. And we had to do leveling from the top of the, the cliffs down to the bottom. And we went and did lead work and built bricks and arches. And we were tutored in all this. Now, in the middle 60s, what happened was there seems to be a move to take the professional examinations away from the RICS and give the education to the academic people in the colleges. And then say to those colleges, yes, we will give you dispensation so you can train surveyors. I think what happened then was that the people actually teaching didn't have any connection, or few of them had connection, with the RICS. So it would tend to water down what was actually being taught. OK? When we got to the 1968, the creation of the Building Surveyors Division was just about that sort of time. And they split off the, general, the building surveyors from the um, general practice. So there are a number of us who are curiosities now, in so much as I happen to be a registered valuer, but I also am allowed to teach people who are training for their APC. But this is not something that happens very much now. Now, I think one will get into a position where if you, f you really focus in on what the person sitting in the office can advise a client as a chartered surveyor, if it is totally restricted, where are they going to go? Do you just, when they come and sit down in front of you and say, well, I can advise you on this, I can't advise you on that, and I can advise you on this, the thing is daft. I think this is particularly relevant in the rural communities and in the little t the towns and villages outside the main urban areas. And I think it is very pertinent that if you go back to what we were looking at, they cannot advise because they're told not to advise on anything they don't know. So what I'm trying to say is, I mean, if you look at this is in 1968. This is the new, the new general surveying subjects that were being taught. They had lost a chunk of the building construction because it went off to the building surveyors. When you got to the 19th, early 1970s, when I was actually on a committee at Kingston, and we were looking at taking the diploma, which had been ex allowed by the RICS, from a diploma to a degree, we had exactly the same sort of thing going on. You had building surveyors, you had general surveyors, and they did not match. But what <coughs> happened when they got qualified? They sit down in an office, and somebody comes in, and I said, I've got a house I want to do up, or I've got a house I want valued. You've got to have two people to do it. And it, it gets extremely muddling. And it also, in times of recession, it can completely liquidate a lot of the surveyors because they can't afford to do any work. I mean, we're incredibly lucky where we are that we've managed to do everything an old-fashioned general practice used to do. So we could design houses. We could design extensions to schools. We could do the surveys. We could do the valuations. We could do the management. They're all connected. As somebody said to me when I started training, you will never be out of work if you're doing something with housing because people have to live in the house. And they said that one thing you could remember, whenever the politics goes to the left, you can be absolutely sure you're going to get lots and lots of work. So remember that when there's a change of government of some sort. It, uh, this is what happens. So what I'm trying to say to you is that in the path 
to create the problems they have done. It started way back in the 60s, into the 70s, and now it's, <coughs> it's difficult. Is that better? Are we questioning whether the new setup or the, the existing setup is purpose for what we should be having as surveyors? I don't think we are. Now, you may not agree with me. To take another church example, there was a chap who qualified with me to preach. And after 20 years, suddenly he was in church one morning and some woman stood up at the back and said, you don't believe in God, and then started ranting. Now, I'm not in that position today, but if anybody doesn't agree, put your hand up and tell me why. I think there's something basically wrong in what is going on now. Now, how you change it, I don't know. Certainly it's not going to be me, because I've a, we're probably over the hill and should be doing something else. But I do think we have a problem with the RICS in so much as they rely so much on their academic people who educate their, their pupils or their students. And I just think somebody should think we should question what is, what is actually being taught. <coughs> this, for example, is a paper which was set by the Chartered Auctioneers and Estate Agents Institute. You probably remember, if you were there at the time, that in the late 60s, early 70s, there was an amalgamation of the RICS, the auctioneers, and the land agents. My father was a land agent, and he thought it was the worst thing that ever happened in his life. He really thought we were going downhill, he thought he was, because they were a fairly ex exclusive bunch. They had a nice little office in Lincoln's Inn, and they were very friendly. They had a set of arrogance amongst, amongst themselves, and to have to be lumped in with these horrible surveyors wasn't something which they were very fond of. Things have changed so radically. When, when I was going, thought of going to be a surveyor, my father, who was a land agent of a large estate at the time, rang up the RICS and said, uh, can I speak to the secretary? Well, you can't expect that to happen today. Oh, yes, it's a Mr. Brown. So he gets hold of Mr. Brown, who's the secretary of the RICS at the time in Parliament Square, and he says, um, I've got a son who's interested in being a surveyor. Can I come up and see you? And you think, it's mind-boggling to think that's what we did. Just went up there, went through the doors, turned right, that's where his office was, and he gave me a briefing of how it is to be a surveyor. Looking back, I can't think what my father thought about it because he didn't really think it was the place to be. He would much prefer to be down at Lincoln's Inn. Anyway, this particular paper is of interest because when the RICS joined with the auctioneers and the estate agents and the land agents, the auctioneer's papers included bookkeeping. <coughs> and <coughs> to me, I find it very strange that people could have a course for surveying, sometimes go into business, and don't even have the rudiments of how the bookkeepers work, or how you have a balance of account, or how you make a profit. As far as I know, there's nothing in the curriculum to do it. So when the auctioneers joined with the RICS. I was incredibly lucky because I was the firm I was acting for I was so employed by. They had students each year, so there was one that got out of the other end each year. But they expected their students to do night <coughs> school and do all the RICS exams and all the auctioneers exams. The RICS exams were about seven. The auctioneers was eight or nine papers. So you had something like two weeks of exams. When they joined together, I just had to look at the one which I hadn't failed first. And I actually got through on the auctioneers ones because they joined them all in together, which was quite lucky. I think my life seemed to be punctuated by that because I joined as a student member of the RICS two weeks before they put it up to A-levels. Um, but that's on an aside. Coming back to this, yes, I think if you were to start with a blank piece of paper and say what do you want to educate your surveyors, that should be included. Including, <clears throat> when you look at the, the course I started with in 66, it included structures. It included practical surveying. 
Now, we say to ourselves, oh, well, that's for somebody else to do. But I'm sure, and I was very bad at structures, I'm sure if there was an element of education on structures, when you talk to an engineer, you're in a much better place than where you would be if you totally ignored it. Which is another point which I'm trying to make, that if you do not have that education to be able to talk to your specialist, which is my other criticism of the education, you will find that you ha aren't having a proper conversation, basically. Right. What was the previous standard which might have been better? I think the, this is an example, believe it or not, of a bit of a report which you can hardly read on that house which we surveyed in 1975. What was the previous standard which might have been better? I'm just saying that the surveyors that did the surveys in the middle 70s had had the education in the 60s probably, and I think they had more <coughs> in their pocket to write that report than they probably have today. The only exception, which I would come on to later on, is to do with damp and timber. You put that little phrase. We found damp, we would advise a damp and timber <coughs> specialist. But these days, everything is a bit more difficult, isn't it? You're not allowed to say things. Right, impact of new materials. We've had new materials during the, so, the, the, the total time I've been doing surveying. And if you look back on it, if you take, for example, asbestos slates, are we, we can only report on what we know of that material at the time we do the survey. When you get to my age and you look back and say, oh, we thought that was quite good, but actually it turned out to be not so good. But the same thing applied to flat roofs. Flat roofs in the 70s were fine. And now you get this idea <coughs> from the press that you shouldn't have a flat roof, although you can get a 30-year guarantee. I think, what is your attitude to new materials when you come, <coughs> upon, it, come upon it as a surveyor doing a building survey? I think you can only read up about it you can't ignore it, but you, as long as you do the research on it, that is all you can be asked to do. All right? Now, the burden of new materials. There's a, they, I put it here. To be efficient, it says building surveyor, or indeed any sort of surveyor concerned with development, is necessary to keep up to date. This is what I'm really trying to say to you, that your only responsibility is to go and do sufficient research to be able to comment upon something. I talked to a client yesterday, and we're going to look at a, a cress farm, watercress farm. And I said, well, I can't do this, and I can't do that. I can do some research on that, and our charges will be this, this, and this. Because you, there are limitations as to what you can you know, find out about. The wonders of the web, you find a lot more out now than you ever did before. But as long as you can say to the client, look, this is a new material, I've done so much research on it, and this is what it is, I think one's justified to put that in your report. If you simply say, I'm going off to see a specialist, or I suggest you go to a specialist, I think that's just not justifying your fee half the time. I think it is important. You see, you can go into all this construction thing if you go on the web, and it's a bit difficult, really difficult. But I think you've got to be absolutely straight with your client as to where your limitations are and what you're charging for. Right, if we go back to the 1970s, how were the instructions received. People are very hot on this, understandably, because everybody is really keen to make sure they're not going to be sued for anything. In the 70s, it wasn't quite the same. That's the bill. 
That was the instructions. It's horrifying, isn't it, really? <laughs> I think it's Major something Garrett of the Staff College at Camberley. And I think the property was 163 Endlesham Road or Street, SW18. And we did the survey and we charged him 75 quid. Uh, if the, they didn't, I think it was accepted, you're doing a structural survey and that's your fee and that was the end of it. But now you can't do that. <coughs> what were the clients expecting? What stay, steps were you taking <coughs> to achieve the clients? aspirations. I think they saw the house as a building which they were going to buy and they want, didn't want any surprises when they bought it. That was all they wanted. And if you got a letter saying I want you to make sure you look at the drains or you look at this, you would do that. I think I don't think that's vastly different from today, but the bits of paper we have to send out with our acceptance of instructions are run to about five pages, even for the home buyers thing. The litigation was a lot less than it? <sighs> we got it. Yeah. But I mean, nowadays you're expected to report on if you've got Japanese not working in the garden. True, quite true. Um, and it's amazing how many times that comes. saying they haven't mentioned it. Quite true. I, I would go with that, absolutely. <coughs> now, yes, going on to examples of claims made. I don't know about you, but in the course of one's time, you remember the ones where you made a complete cock-up. Whether you take note of it, but you always remember it. I remember one, one of my ones, which was very sad because I'd had a really good solicitor giving me work. Those are the days where we didn't have people like JJ around who put things through on a computer. And so we were really anxious to get these surveys. But they found some dry rot in a first floor flat in St. George's Drive in London. And I said, well, I, 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 couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't be found to have missed it or anything. Then they then opened up the floorboards and they found underneath a package for the Mr. Kipling cake, and it had a date on it, believe it or not, and I was completely sunk. Uh, so that, but you, you will probably find the same thing. If you may do a building survey and you make a cock up, it doesn't go away. So it's things like something settling, and you find it was a defective gully, and then somebody says, you know what the soil type here is? No, it's sand. And what was the name of the house? Sand Cottage. You know, it's, it's crazy. Um, but I think that sort of thing. And then chemical damp courses on a, de on a claim. And this is quite a long time ago. We had a cob wall. And the damp course company were meant to drill it and put in a chemical damp course. Now, I would never do that now, but I do remember this, that the judge said, it's no use you putting in this phrase, go to a damp specialist. You're meant to be a surveyor. You're meant to give the advice, not kind of park it off on somebody else. So, and then somebody said, cobwalls, you put in the drill, and as the drill comes out, all the rubble in the middle will collapse. So basically, they can't put any chemicals in. So no wonder it's damp. Nowadays, of course, you think you won't do that anyway because you don't want to dry it out. But in those days, there you are. And then there was the case of a drought and a defective septic tank. Do many of you deal with septic tanks? You know what they are? No. Not on the mains? Yeah. Something in the garden, you know? And now we've got these, all these wonderful rules where they're all going to be um, mini sewage plants. But in those days, in a drought, and there was a problem. The grass was all br dry and brown, but there was a patch of green just beyond the septic tank. And you think, I missed that. And somebody pointed out, well, that's the French drain which should kind of s disperse all your sewage. And it's incredibly healthy in the middle of a drought. There must be something wrong. So you learn. And there was a case when I just started where 
I was doing one of these jobs where you, um, you have two rooms in a London house and they want to bash the wall down and put a steel in. And I had a friend who was doing building surveying and learning it at college. And he th said he knew all about steels. And I didn't <coughs> question him because I'd been sort of s taught about it but didn't actually <coughs> go there. I said, OK, you give me a seal steel size and we'll deliver it to site and we'll put it in. Well, it turned up and it sat in the road for about three months because nobody could lift it. It was incredibly heavy. And this poor chap, I mean, yet later on, he came an eminent building surveyor. But just looking at it, it was a disaster. And eventually, we had to haul it away and get something, something else. But as I said, even in the 70s and later, negligence claims were still about. And it, I know they're, it's, they're very difficult. And Toby sort of sorts mine out now. I love it. I, get, I just say, um, I'm afraid somebody's after me. And he, he goes off and he rings them up and talks to them and does all the proper, proper procedures as, as it's done. But um, it, 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 it's not much fun because it, 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 knocks you, it knocks your kind of pride to bits and you keep questioning it, even if it's absolute rubbish what they're talking about. Um, How relevant is education to the reports Saver surveyors are writing? I had somebody come to our office who is now working in the management department, and she's done a course with Reading. And I said to myself, well, I asked her, I said, do you do schedules of condition? Never done them. Schedules of lapidation? Never done them. Do you work on CAD? No. I just find this is totally nonsensical. If you take Leonardo da Vinci and you see his sketches of bones and bits, you know, all of the body, he knew all that before he was going to paint. How can somebody criticize a building, talk and kind of work it all out in his mind or her mind unless he knows what's going on inside? And I don't believe, unless you actually draw something out and see how it works, you're not in a very good place to criticize what you're looking at as a surveyor in a building surveying report. <coughs> I just think it's, there's something, <coughs> something missing. So what I'm saying is the education today, there's something wrong. Restrictions on what a surveyor can say? How many reports have, I'm afraid I can't report on that because you're going to have to go off and see a specialist. If the education you're getting is not sufficient and you have to say that, surely you are short on the knowledge you should bring to that report. There must be something wrong. <coughs> and the role of specialists, I think going back to what I said about the judge, the judge said, you're supposed to be a surveyor. Don't kind of hide by behind a damp and timber report. You've got, you're going to have to, from a specialist, because the specialist might be wrong. You must use your own judgment on what you know. Yes, I understand for heating, electrics, and all that sort of thing, you have to go to those that are specialist. It. You have to go to engineers, but you've got to be able to speak their language. We've had a very tortuous <laughs> job in London, in Wandsworth, just recently where we've had, uh, if you could imagine, a shop front with two floors above, right? And there's a Bressema beam, which is old-fashioned Victorian Bressema beam. And there's a baby balcony at the front, which is no more than 900 wide. And the brickwork on the front is cracking. Now, we thought, well, there was a scheme by the landlord not by the tenant, who t ironically ends up being responsible for doing the work, to take the beam out and put a new beam in, which was going to be incredibly expensive. We came up with a solution where some steels were put in either side of the beam, which supported, we dry pack and keep the wall in place. That was fair enough until the builder opened up and found the rock was quite fantastic. So we wasted weeks and weeks working out to do. So I was going down to engineers' offices and saying, look, what do we do now? I don't want to take this, 
this beam out because the disruption is so great. So we came up with the conclusion of using epoxy resin inside the rotten bit. Now going back to what they were saying this morning about the strength of the support and thing, it's quite interesting on the resin, epoxy resin, they can use that. I'd heard about it for conservation places where the bottom of a beam has gone rotten and they didn't want to take the beam out. And what they did, they shut it up, just like concrete, a support. Eventually what has happened, we have done that. We got this epoxy and it's, it's just like concrete in some ways and then you dry pack from that. But we had to have all that communication with the engineers in order to make the thing work. And in that situation, there's the specialists. They're the people who do it. Ironically, with engineers, you have a resistance to do anything with timber. I don't know whether you come across this, but they much prefer a steel beam because they can do it on their computers. And the timber, the timber um, calculations are that much more difficult, so I'm told. But I think it... it that is the role of the specialist. So you've got, obviously, the services. You've got the dampened timber, you should be able to make a, take a view on it. Impact of legislation and the internet. Ooh, Grenville, two or three years down the line, we're suddenly being hit hard. I know Toby's had a, a lot to do with these fire doors. And I've just done a dilapidations claim where I'm acting for the tenant, and I've had to concede that these doors are going to have to be taken out completely and not only we just have we're going to have separate frames to go with the ply doors half hour fire door plus the seals and everything else the impact down the line is horrendous that this is going to come I don't know what I would have thought it was going over the top but they're going back to Grenville for this and they've changed all the regulations I think when we started trying to negotiate on another block of flats about two three years ago there are only three companies producing this, these, these kind of doors with their frames and things. Now there are more. And the building regulation people, they were wallowing around. They really didn't know what to do next. <coughs> so legislation can have an impact. Um, and I think as long as you kind of do your research, that, that is what is so important. You can't, I mean, if you do, for example, if you do a survey on a flat in a block, and you go into the communal parts and you see all these fire doors, which I did the other day, and they were totally inadequate. You know, they had kind of stuff stuck, stuffed in from Magnet or one of these other companies, not fire doors at all. You can now say, well, you're going to have to replace not only the door, but the side, and it's got to be certified. So it's understanding is the main point. Uh, the internet, I suppose what it's saying, if you get into court with a problem, they can turn around to you and say, well, didn't you read this? Didn't you research that? Which in the old days, you could probably say, <coughs> no, I didn't, because I didn't have the book, or I didn't think that was relevant. Uh, I think it is really important to be able to give advice and show the pattern of where you came from. <coughs> so for example, if you were doing a survey on a thatched house in the middle of nowhere, you would say, I saw the thatch, I noted that the thatch has come off previously. You haven't got the old poles. You've got new timber, new battens, but the ridge is gone and the top is gone and you're going to have to replace the lot. Or you could just replace the top 80%, which some thatchers will do. If you give that, that sort of spill as to how you get to your advice, that to me is far more valuable than just saying, oh, well, the roof's had it, you're going to have to start again, I would suggest you go down and see a thatcher. What's quite interesting with thatchers, I don't know whether you've ever come across them, but they have a proprietary interest in particular houses, and <coughs> whoever owns that house, they suddenly discover there is a thatcher for it. And they get very upset if it goes to another thatcher. Right, so the impact on le of legislation and the internet on reports is important. And it wasn't around when we were in the 70s, so you can't criticize it. What do we do and what do we say about the education today? Well, I went on the internet for the Kingston University and found this, which is a three-year course or a four-year four full-time course, and then looked at an MSc. Now, one thing I would say is in this, it says, 
what they're going to educate them to do. The design of a simple structure. Are you saying that surveyor, building surveyors can only design an extension to a house? It, it doesn't make any sense to me. Are you going to give all the work to architects? I've worked with architects in the past, but there is a general feeling with architects who spent three years discussing the aesthetics that when they have designed the house and it is built, they walk away. If you're a surveyor, I mean, we did a lot of work for the Church of England at one stage, and we extended schools up to about a million and a half. Now, when we designed them, we're very aware that they, that school can come back to us five years, ten years down the line and said, this is wrong with it. The maintenance is terribly important. You know on the CDM <coughs> legislation where well, maintenance is important, which is something that is, was very good because people just started to design to understand how they could maintain that property. There's no way you could produce a roof that nobody could actually walk on if it was a flat roof. One has criticisms of some of these single membrane roofs. I don't know whether you've come across those. But if you have a single membrane roof, on the whole of it, it's shiny. And I had a case of one of the people who I was employed with. And we got the manufacturer's rep down to check it when it was being done. When it was done, the chap ended up in my employee's arms as he fell off the roof because he slipped on this thing which was quite frightening. But I think, <coughs> I, I think my whole thing here is I think the education system is actually reducing the amount of expertise that you can display to advise to clients. And that, to me, is not only restricting the individual who has been educated, but is also restricting the profession as a whole. If you say, I can't. I've got a small building to be designed. What's it say? A design of a simple structure. They've done three years, and all they're up to doing is an extension. I mean, it's crazy. So what I'm saying is that you should be able to give advice, having got the right education, to as many people as possible. You're there to serve the community, not to say to them, look, I can't do this, you've got to go to here. And I can't do that, and I've got to go to there. I get extremely cross with the solicitors sometimes. I don't know whether you have anything to do with them. But you have a client that goes off to a solicitor and gives him a problem, or her a problem. And about a week or two weeks later, you'll get a letter. And the letter says, we've looked at your problem. Here is our account. We would advise you go to counsel's opinion. And you think, this is ridiculous. They're employed as a legal advisor to do something. In our case, we have direct access to barristers. And I don't know how many people use it. I use it a lot of the time. If I have a problem, I will ring a chamber somewhere and talk to the client and say, this is the problem. I get to send it to you. Give me a quote for an advice. The one thing about barristers, they're totally focused on what you want. You might not get the advice you want, but it does mean that at the end of the day, if you have a dispute, you know exactly where you stand, which is really important. So, so the current position is that the education at college, practical. They come out of college. They can't, if they're not doing part-time, which to me is a really good idea because you get the practical side of it, they come out of college they then do the practical. <coughs> so for a person employing people like myself, this is a complete waste of time. They're not practically unemployable at that time for a couple of years. I get a bit cheesed off sometimes when I've had students who are just on the point that they're likely to get qualified and somebody nicks them. It's rather like these football clubs, isn't it? I just feel I've invested all this money and they've gone. Um, one thing as I was saying about um, making mistakes, you, over the years, you sometimes have confrontations with people. And I had one with a roofer on a large flat roof uh, in the middle of nowhere. 
and he was obviously a very well-fed roofer because he was quite big and he had a sidekick with him and we were standing on this roof and he said when was the last time you did a roof and you have no answer to that and you think he's got a point how could I possibly criticize the chap if I hadn't actually been there now if you in the 60s and 70s if you were training to be a land agent for example they sent you out to do practical you had to go and work on a farm or work for a firm of land agents for a year what would be the position if people who wanted to be building surveyors had to fill in a form and said we worked for some builders for three three months or six months they would get far more experience doing that than they would from any books whether we could pers persuade people to take that on board is a different matter but I think the idea of uh, apprenticeships is not a very attractive to me but I think if you could put the mechanism in so that people for example doing building surveying which I understand is far more difficult than other divisions to pass if they actually had that practical experience I think that would be really helpful the <coughs> APCs they are also extremely difficult fortunately I've never had to take one qualification well that's after that isn't it so in concluding the demise of the RICS exams and general practice division did it hand over the education to educationists that is I think one of the core problems on the education of surveyors the end of general practice surveyors existence did not result in public client being provided with a lesser service of cost at the same cost I think it did I think it meant that they had, um, had they were presented with a report which is, was of lesser value than it would have been 30, 40, 50 years ago. Are surveyors now led by insurance companies to produce advice which has less value? Same thing. It is. We've ha I've been here and I've listened to insurance companies and I totally understand where they're coming from, that you should have all the words to make it gunproof that you're not going to be sued. But if you get into a dispute and you end up in court and you're outside and you're about to go in, you'll have the insurance people there and they'll say, right, we want to settle. They're not supporting you. They're looking after their bank account. Because they keep saying to you, oh, it's no reflection on your worth as a surveyor. We're not admitting liability. It is really has to be taken into account. <coughs> and we cannot, in these days, avoid that situation. We're not powerful enough to say to the insurance companies, no, we want to keep on fighting it. I have never seen anybody who has been faced with that come away and insist on going through the court procedure. Because you'll probably be there sitting there, there for two, two weeks and you can't afford it anyway. Does the role of the specialist give the surveyor an opt-out of responsibility to negate the value of the report? I would strongly suggest it does. Because I think, for example, in the damp and timber things, it is for you to advise, it is for you to give some sort of idea of cost. Now, this was the point we were discussing at lunch, lunchtime. I think okay. if you do a report, somehow or other, the education system should enable you to give some sort of cost as to do remedial work Otherwise, the client doesn't know where he's going. Or you're going to tell him to go off and get, well, this is what's wrong. You go off to four different builders and get costs for it, and I'll look at it if you like, if you're happy. No, I think you should have some idea of value. Going back to the point, if you've got a proper general practice which does <coughs> a lot of things like management and other things, you have a database of how much things are going to cost, particularly in particular areas. Should the RSA RCS look at the training of surveyors to provide a better service to the public and the clients. Yes, I really do think they do. Now, I do appreciate, and I'm just as guilty as anyone, I haven't attended practically no RICS meetings. So, we get what we pay for. If 
we don't turn up to these meetings and fight the case, we will just go on the way we were before. Because we're trying to earn a living, uh, most of us, and every hour of the day is important by way of fees. We haven't got time to go off to meetings here and meetings there. I think the only thing I'd done for the RICS was in the early 70s, I used to play for their cricket team. I've even got the tie to prove it, and I don't think there's even, even a uh, cricket team now, but there you are. No, I th difficult. What I've said, I'm sure everybody else has another view, and probably those who've been more qualified more recently will say, of course we were educated where we thought we were going to be educated, and we can now use that as advice to our clients. All I'm trying to say is that I think it should be questioned. I think somebody at the top should look at the education all over again and clear away the debris, not the debris, but of the academic control of the colleges. Because I think there's something that says you're academic. You're not people who are doing a survey every day of the week. You're, and you're not giving advice to people. It's all to do with books. Yes, if you do your APC, I'm sure a lot of this will be sorted out. But I feel for the employees, for employers, that they're given next to nothing. And those coming to them are wanting thousands of pounds, and they're going to have to be subsidizing them for at least a couple of years to be of any monetary use. Um, yes, I'm whinging. I'm sorry, it's probably my age. <laughs> But uh, I doubt today that three out of four of us are probably in the same bracket of age and education. Um, and we're complete dinosaurs and we should go off and look after our cabbages or something, or bath chairs. But uh, I just think of Mr. Biden, think, thank God for him. <laughs> um, yes, any questions? Yes? So first off, Jesse, A, um, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, B, I'm, I'm, I was about to say obviously, but I'm younger. Yes. <laughs> um, and so my, my qualification route was um, quite different to, yes. to your kind of traditional yes. surveyor. So I was an estate agent. Yeah. And I went through a graduate trainee yep. scheme, um, got my ASOP RICS in yes. 2013, yep. became chartered 2018. Yep. And I wish that I had the training that people before me had. Um, because I can see, doing what I do now, which we spoke yeah. about at, at lunch, I can see the value that older surveyors actually yeah. bring. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right in terms of the fear of liability. Yeah. That seems to be the biggest issue. Um, case in point, so just um, yeah. just for background, so I, I mentioned I do report auditing yeah. and vetting. Yeah. Um, last week, I read a level three home survey report. Yeah. Um, that report said, there's a crack on the rear elevation. This is, is pretty much what they said. So like there's a crack on the rear elevation. You need to see a structural engineer. You know, what that's are you that's trained that's for? Exactly. So you know, the point being that if you're if you're not willing to kind of put your assessment yeah. of the cause of that crack yeah. on paper, then you shouldn't deliver the survey, in my view. No, um, it's crazy. Can it's, I? Can I? Can I? Can I put an Posing. Yes, do. <laughs> Just keep going. So I, I started in a state agency. I worked in architecture and yeah. I'm a building surveyor. Yeah. And what I've learned um, is that um, I'm a general practitioner. I'm yes. not a specialist in no. anything. Yeah. I give it, I'm just like your GP. Yeah. I know an awful lot about an awful lot of things, yeah. but I don't know the specialist then. Right. So I'm protecting my client, and if I see the crack on a level three, I will tell them the possible, possible reasons that it's there, but I should give them the option to go to a specialist. I, so I can I, see that. And but what, I what, also, on the price, mm. I learned in architecture, yeah. you give a client a figure. Yeah. You're not quoting for repairing crack. Yeah. You're not yeah. quoting for replacing <coughs> yeah. a day. I mean, the sash window in the London yeah. house could be 10 grand. Yeah. But if I tell my client that, that's what they'll remember. Yeah. So I say to my clients, it's going to be 
print prices, it's going to be thousands. Yeah. Go to a window specialist yeah. because they are quoting every yes. day. And if I'm protecting yeah. you, yeah. I can give you ideas, but it's very important <coughs> that they understand I have a genuine knowledge. I, I am not a specialist. I understand entirely where you're coming from. In my case, it's slightly different because we actually do lots of renovation work in London and the West Country. So we, ha we have that data. Uh, but what I was trying to say to you is that if you're educating a surveyor, you should give him more tools. I know you're general. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. I also flog houses. But, yeah. <laughs> but I think if he, I'm just saying there's something wrong in the content. And if the content was different, your position would be easier. Now, going back to what our friend said over there, I think if there's a crack, you can go, you don't, if you can't do the pricing, you could go through all the reasons as to why there could yes, be a crack. Exactly. So when they get, when you do send it to the engineer, you could say, the engineer would say, oh, well, this surveyor's taken it on board. He said it's either subsidence, it is kind of um, cavity wall problems, or it's roof spread, or whatever it is. But put it all down, rather than just shelving it off to the person Yes, I mean, you, you were talking about a level two. Yeah. No, no, I, I was talking no, about no, level what two. What I'm saying is oh. that piece of reporting yeah. was to level two. Th yeah, that's, and that's, that's what I was yeah. saying. There's a lot of surveys that actually don't meet the requirements no. at level three. But, but I do think that, that people, I, I think you'll find that the clients have changed now because, mm -hmm. because of the nanny state, yeah. they think that I'm going to to be responsible for everything. Oh yes, if so I overstep the mark, it's like having an insurance policy, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it could, that's what a survey report. Yeah, it's, it's yes, it's right. It's a cheap one. Well, okay. Half a brain cell, they know. They bother to read the report. And yeah, it's a problem, and then I'll try and see them. But yeah, but, um, but, but the point is, you have to set expectations with the client. Yeah. If you pretend that you you are the world's leading no. expert on no. everything, no. they will they. They'll be patting in your hands and believe everything, and you've got to yeah. make it clear. I I can give you some ideas, yeah. but if you really want the person who yeah. does this every yeah. day, inside out, repairs yeah. cracks yeah. every day, or as my friend looks at cracks every day, that sort of then you need to make it clear. If you want the ultimate advice, yeah. you need to go to the person. I think. I mean, I've it. I've taken on board doing level three, which I resisted for a very long time. And it's got lots in there to protect me. Yeah. Um, when I had the bespoke ones, which I just use for commercial now, um, that's slightly different. But hopefully that protects me. But I always think if I'm putting a cost down in a particular area, yeah. I could ring up a builder and say, "What do you think?" Yeah. You know. Uh, and if they come back and say, "Oh, well, it's costing twice as much," I said, "You're probably going to the wrong builder. I can send you one." It's true, but. I what you mentioned there was protecting you. Yeah. Of course, we all protect ourselves, but to protect the client, yeah. I think, as I say, is making it appear that you know more than you do. There's, there's court cases to back yeah. up yeah. reasons for not yeah. doing that. Well, well, it's down to what we started off with. Yeah. You know, you've got to give that you've got the competency to, re to report, basically, isn't it? I, for, from, to my mind, with the client, you want to get a a sort of plan of action yeah. and get a shopping list. Yeah. You do need to go to the dance specialist, you do need to go to the yeah. electrician. I'm telling you who to go with. Yeah. Get your spreadsheet, yeah. get it all priced out, buy the individual whose yeah. speciality yeah. it is, then, then you protect yourself. Because both level quality. two and three <coughs> list those ones, don't they? Um, yeah, I mean, so you know you want an electrical test, you want a dance, you exactly. want a timber, exactly. you want somebody who knows about solar panels. But, but the trouble is that I think, I think our client's expectations nowadays is that you're going to tell them everything and take them home yeah. and basically. Yeah, I know. And, it, and I, I think we've got to well, get I have, to think. I have it very, find it very frustrating what perceptions they have. But I think that is a change from the clients we're talking about. I think you're quite right. They, they, yeah. they, they, I think before you got the internet, before you had the social media and everything, you were respected as a surveyor. Yes. And now we have a position where the client thinks he knows everything. And that is very difficult. And you just wonder, why did he come to us in the first place? 
I mean, I've got a case at present on a letted house which is let, and we've done some damp proofing. And the wretched tenant thinks he's a bee's knees and he's done some course in building over the years. And we get screeds of paper saying, you've got it all wrong, you've got it all wrong. I won't have this and I won't have this. And the class <coughs> and I just put our hands up and think, what in the heck do we do with this man? He knows too much or he knows sufficient that it is wrong. And I don't know how you deal with people like that. In some ways, I'd be glad to be retired because I, I think it's only getting worse. <laughs> No, every so often you, you help, perhaps in my case you help a young couple, yeah. and it's all very yeah. scary, they're, they're spending over half a million yeah. pounds on their first property, and you can add value. Oh yes, oh yes, oh, yes. You, you feel you have done your job. But it's you much have help. to make sure yeah. that they're not thinking yeah. that no. sort of... Yeah. I, I appreciate other, be other people, people who don't have the data. I can yeah. understand it totally where you're coming from. But, but I think you have to make the client understand. You're buying a house, it's mm. a very complicated, or you're buying a bachelor yeah. if it's something like that. It's a very complicated thing to do. <coughs> and yes, it would be lovely to go have a mm. one-stop shop mm. with the spare, but it doesn't work like mm. that. But yeah. we're always aware that, um, and I've said it's happened in the past, I've done the survey, done the pricing, and they come to you and say, Will you do the spes? And will you do the tenders? Yeah. And you go, ah, of course, absolutely. And then you wait for the tenders to come back, and it, you've almost kind of shot your foot, self in the foot. Yeah. Justin, there's um, there is a CPD consultation out at the moment. Yeah. Do you have any views on any kind of prescriptive CPD that you think should form part of that, or do you do you have a view? Um, what on the things which we should have in order to provide a proper service? Is that it? Well, I guess in terms of CPD consultation, um, you know, <coughs> CPD as it stands yes. is, you know, not it, obviously it's man mandatory, but yeah. it's voluntary in terms of the aspects that you actually. <coughs> That's right. So, do you do you think there is a place for more prescriptive CPD? Yes, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. Um, I mean, I would hope there will be kind of a list like trees, which are very important, you know. Um, you can't really do much with services because it's beyond our, our wit. Um, yes, so the, I've seen, I've been to a number here um, where they're really good, but then sometimes you feel it's just an infill to get those extra hours at the end of the year. Uh, and you, <laughs> you find the courses at the end of the year are full. <laughs> but um, there, it's uh, interesting. I mean, I must say, to JG that I'm really grateful for what he's put into us as a profession by providing this this auction particular thing of getting instructions. When I started, we moved into this little town and the bloke who sold me the property, the estate agent, said, oh, what are you going to do down here? I know you're coming from London. I said, I'm going to do surveys. And he said, oh, no, you're not. We do all the surveys around here. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very, and the solicitors always went to the same people. Now, when you had people like JG producing this sort of system, suddenly you get surveys all over the place, mm -hmm. and we we're very grateful because I mean, it, we it basically kept us in business for a time, which is much appreciated. Yes, I think that we'll probably have to think about it. But give me your email, and I'll email you my thoughts on that. Yeah. Yes. You caused me great anguish several times. Oh Lord, Three what have I done wrong? <laughs> <laughs> You've used this term structural survey. I know, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I know, it's a building survey now. If because you recall, many years ago, yeah. the institutions all got together. I know they did. Civils, I know. Said, Don't use but you're an engineer, you see. They, we, we, you got it and you took away the structural surveys. And we've now well, got well, building well, surveys. Well, what do you think a structural well, survey well, is? Originally, originally, when I started, it was doing much the same as I'm doing now. But when they changed it to building survey, I know that I, there was engineers involved, basically. Does that make any sense? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> yes, my apologies. Knowing you're an engineer, I can, I can understand where you're coming from. Anything else? They're actually level three surveys. <laughs> I know they are, but I can still do a building survey and not use that. I'm not mandatory to do it, am I? No. Mm -hmm.
It has, I have had my hands twisted to do level three, and that's what I do, yeah. except for the commercial ones. I haven't been told I have to do those. To say on the structural surveys, in fact, um, on, on local surveyors direct on the system, there's quite a few building surveyors who list as structural inspections because they know that there's still lots of people out there in the public mm -hmm. who, when they're looking for a building survey, actually go looking for a structural survey. That's the problem, yeah. isn't it? It is yeah. a perception. Yeah, yeah. 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 one of the difficulties with um, the website is trying to get the right person coming on the right place for the right yeah. thing. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's, it, it's just uh, a lot of people moving around. But hopefully, eventually, people are able to talk to people and sort of what they want. But anyway, that was great. Thanks, John. Thank you.